This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 1026, recorded on July 14, 2023. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses, Joining me today here at the Incubator in New York, I was going to say Daniel Griffin, but it's Dixon de Pommier. <laughs> no, now standing in for Daniel Griffin, Dixon de <laughs> today, Hey, hello, Vincent. Isn't it Bastille Day? Uh, July mm-hmm. 14th yeah. is July. Mm-hmm. Bastille Day. Also joining us from Ann Arbor, Michigan, Kathy Spindler. Hi, everybody. Here it's 84 and it says it's drizzling, but I can't really tell that looking out my window, so... Yeah, I don't know if it's drizzling or not, but it's anyway, it's 84. Yeah, supposedly, we have thunderstorms, but it's 31C here. We can't see out the window. We cannot see out Windows the window. are blocked. Also joining us from Austin, Texas, Rich Condit. Hi, everybody. I'm just looking it up. It's 102 here in uh, Austin. In a but it's a dry 100 heat. degree days, <laughs> and, you know, the, the, uh, the news media makes it sound like uh, it's the end of the world. It might be. Uh, but <laughs> fact is, it was hotter this time last year. Right. There you go. From Madison, New Jersey, Brianne Barker. Hi, it's great to be here. Um, and it is the same 87 Fahrenheit, 31 Celsius in New Jersey that it is in New York. <laughs> Our guest today, f- returning from Debunk the Funk, Dan Wilson. Welcome back. Hi, everybody. Good to be back. Hey, Dan. You're somewhere near us, right? You're, you're like Pennsylvania-ish? Yeah, I'm in the Philadelphia area, so also 87 degrees Fahrenheit, partly cloudy, but it feels very, very hot. <laughs> right. So, Dan, when you when you see us introducing like five TWIV members, do you ever think that, you, you know, when you're doing your debunk, you feel lonely? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I don't think so. Okay. It's a different thing, you know, to do one on your own. All right, today we are going to, uh, we have Dan here to help us grapple with uh, recent statements made by RFK Jr., mainly on the the Rogan podcast, but um, also elsewhere. And I've been talking about this for a couple of weeks now, since uh, Dan actually said you ought to do this on TWIV, and then I said, why don't we do it together? And then Dan released his own um, debunking uh, about a week ago, was it, or more? Mm, yeah, a few weeks ago now. Uh, and then this was the first uh, day that we could do it together. So here we are, and maybe for many it has faded, but it's not something that needs to fade. Anyway, the point of saying I've been talking about it is I got a letter, an email, uh, which I will keep anonymous And uh, I want to just read it as a prelude here. I'm writing to you in advance of your show that will address the RFK Jr. Rogan interview because I want you to make the best of it. Of all the public faces of science, I think that you are one of the most well-meaning and trustworthy. I am someone who has been affected personally by vaccine injury, and I want you to know that while sticking very closely to the science is likely to make most sense to you, you will have a hard time winning anybody over if you don't at least acknowledge some of the painful experiences people have had or are having and the difficulty that they, that they are going through. It may indeed be true that the data do not show strong links between vaccines and the poor health outcomes that so many people attribute to them, but nothing anybody says hits home in any way if the people's struggles continue to be swept under the rug, ridiculed, and outright censored. I guess that what I am asking is that you start with compassion rather than data. That will allow the data that you present to actually be heard and is something that people have not received from the medical and scientific community, but something they have received from RFK Jr. All right, folks, thoughts? Well, I would start by saying thank you for the letter. Uh, The letter itself uh, serves the purpose well. Um, uh, I... It's, it is important to acknowledge, and Paul Offit does a great job of this on your most recent, what's that? Beyond the Noise. Beyond the Noise podcast, which I would 
recommend because he's got, he's got all the data in his head, right? So he can quote you chapter and verse on every vaccine, uh, what the incidence of adverse effects are and what sorts of, of things there are. And, you know, he'll be the first to tell you quite truthfully that, um, uh, nothing is completely safe and there are, uh, rare, rare side effects associated with, um, uh, many vaccines. Uh, and it's important to acknowledge that, you know, there are people who are, uh, who are the, uh, who suffer from these. Okay. And for them, it's not rare for them. It's a hundred percent. Um, there are also a lot of other people who suffer from a variety of things and they're being told that, uh, uh, that, um, these, the, the, uh, their suffering is due to vaccines or other things. And, uh, it's, uh, that's, uh, in most cases not true. Okay. That doesn't mean that they aren't still suffering. Okay. And in fact, I would argue that the suffering is even made worse by the fact that they're, uh, being, not being told the truth. Um, and I would, uh, so I want to acknowledge that there are, uh, are people out there that are hurting and that's why there's so much conversation about this. Um, and I would say that, uh, uh, these podcasts that we do for which we don't get paid, um, these podcasts that we do, uh, and the debunking that we do is an act of compassion in itself. Uh, because the best thing that we can do for everybody who is uh, suffering is to do the best science we possibly can and to make sure that everybody understands what the truth is. So let's do that. Anyone else? I just ditto Richard. I, I, I'm uh, probably the oldest member of this group. I can remember in the very beginning of my uh, science career, uh, being introduced to the concept that, you know, when you give a uh, hundred million people something, uh, you're going to get a wide variety of responses, no matter what it is. It starts with aspirin and works its way up to the most complicated uh, chemotherapies for cancers. Uh, some people do very well and other people don't do well at all. Uh, the word compassion is the underlying cause for wanting to go into medicine to begin with. And, and in, in in this case, with us, that's the reason why we're doing this. And I think uh, I totally agree with Richard that, that we are compassionate and we would like to be able to show more of it. Uh, <clears throat> and we try our best, but sometimes it uh, slips through the cracks. And uh, we're sorry for that. I think I want to point out that when we were talking about the COVID vaccines, we whenever there was a side effect and blood clotting with yeah. adenovirus vectors, um, myocarditis, uh, we always talked about them, never tried to hide them. Right. right. Um, I think that everything that Rich said was fabulous. Um, so thank you for that, Rich. Um, also, thank you, Anonymous. Um, I'm really sorry to hear that this happened to you um, and to everyone else who is um, being personally affected by vaccine injury. Um, I really liked the thing that Rich pointed out um, about how there are many people who are suffering um, and it is frustrating to me sometimes to um, hear that people are not, that we don't know why someone is suffering and that maybe we are not always thinking of a uh, entirely truthful reason. Um, I hope that all of the folks who are suffering from these vaccine injuries and other things, um, I hope that we can figure out why and make that not happen. Um, that would be an ideal goal. Um, I also hope that there are a lot of people who do not suffer from different infectious diseases. And I think that vaccines are our best way of protecting against that. Um, right now, um, we unfortunately um, have this trade off between rare um, effects of some of these vaccines and the known effects of some of these infectious diseases. Um, I would prefer if we had neither of those things um, and no one had to deal with these. Um, Right now, because one of those things is more rare, a uh, more rare outcome than the other, that's the one that unfortunately um, we're going with. I wish that wasn't the case, and I apologize to anyone who for whom this is happening. Um, and I think, think that Rich said this all beautifully. 
I also want to thank Anonymous for their letter. I think it brings out some important points that we all can stand to be reminded of. And I thank Rich for addressing the letter and making additional comments. I have one further thing, just in case there's anybody listening to the podcast who doesn't know who RFK Jr. is. It's <laughs> Robert Francis Kennedy Jr., who's known also by his initials because his father was known by his initials, because his uncle, John F. Kennedy, was known by his initials. So <laughs> there's a tradition of that, uh, at least with the Kennedys. And RFK Jr. is an American environmental lawyer and author. And uh, he's the son, as I said, of the former attorney general and senator Robert F. Kennedy and nephew of the U.S. President John F. Kennedy. Uh, Dan, you had some thoughts about mm -hmm. uh, the, the attention uh, received from RFK Jr. Love to mm -hmm. hear those. Yeah. Um, I, I first also want to thank Anonymous for sending in their email. Um, with all the debunking of misinformation that we do, it is important to acknowledge that nothing is 100% safe and vaccines can cause adverse effects. And for anybody suffering from an adverse event from a vaccine or from COVID vaccines, uh, please, uh, I ask you to check out the Countermeasures Injury Compensation Program that is specifically for COVID vaccines, and also the Vaccine Injury Compensation Program, which will actually help you get compensation uh, for, your, for your suffering, because uh, we, we don't want that. And in the meantime, scientists are working to make vaccines safer. No scientist looks at vaccine uh, adverse events and says, that's okay, that's acceptable. Scientists are always looking to make them safer. Um, and so my hope is that you are able to find sympathy from your doctors, compensation from your government, and that people like Kennedy don't take advantage of you because I think, unfortunately, that's what he does most of the time. Uh, we know that his organization, the Children's Health Defense, makes a lot of money um, from people who, for one reason or another, are against vaccines. And he uses that money to both pay himself a very handsome salary, pay his staff, and also perform basically publicity stunts. Uh, and I think that's an unfortunate treatment, an unfair treatment of people who are genuinely injured by vaccines. Um, but moving on to RFK <laughs> currently in the news. Um, yeah, he has found a pretty big platform now, um, especially after going on uh, Joe Rogan's podcast, which, by the way, is the most listened to podcast in the world. Tens of millions of downloads each episode. And, um, well, he, he said a lot of interesting things in the podcast, and we can't cover all of them here, but I think we can cover some pretty big ones that seems to have, that seem to have resonated with a lot of people. Yeah. So we, as I said, uh, Dan has covered this in his video, uh, Paul Offit also has done a couple of beyond the noise. Uh, but I'm sure many people have not heard it. So let's go through some of these. Dan has given us a nice outline of, of uh, talking points. So the first one, a claim that RFK Jr. made on Rogan and may have done the same on Friedman, I don't recall. No vaccine on the childhood schedule has ever been tested pre-licensure in a randomized placebo-controlled trial. They are the only drug where that is not required. Yeah. So this is one thing that he has said for many years. He says it in almost every single interview that I have unfortunately listened to him in. Um, and it's just false. It is very false, he, but he states it very confidently and is able to get away with it because there is some complexity here. And so let's just cut to the answer here, which is that it's wrong because Every first vaccine that is released is tested in randomized placebo-controlled trials before going to market. Currently on the childhood vaccine schedule, most of them are updated vaccines because vaccines have been around for many decades 
And as I said earlier, scientists are always looking to make them safer and better. We have had new versions of almost every single vaccine on the, mar on the market. And those new vaccines, those newer versions, those are tested in trials against the old vaccine. Because what happened was the first vaccine trials show that they're safe and effective. And at that point, they become the standard of care. And it's unethical to deprive uh, children of these vaccines that have already been shown to be safe and effective. How much sense would it make to be undergoing, um, say, a trial for a new cancer drug, and in the control group, they get nothing? That wouldn't make any sense. You want them to have a standard of care. So similar here in vaccines, we test them, we test new vaccines against old vaccines, and first vaccines are tested against an unvaccinated control group. So we have, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, uh, somebody uh, went through the show notes and actually has links to a lot of these. And I think that that's really uh, useful. Um, but I was just going to rephrase um, for uh, listeners. So imagine, say, in the 60s, some of these vaccines first went onto the market. At that point, they were tested against a placebo control. But during those trials, we learned that they were better. And so, in fact, we're now trying to improve on them. But the that first one that started to work and went into humans, exactly as Dan said, um, was tested against a placebo. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so we have links in the show notes to all of the vaccines on the current schedule, uh, from polio to hep A and chicken pox. Um, and what you'll find in all of those trials is that the majority or all of the deaths or serious illnesses were in the control group, that the vaccines were very were shown to be very effective, and since then have, of course, saved a lot of lives. Now, another point that often comes up here is uh, one that Paul Offit actually talked about in the Beyond the Noise episode is um, in subsequent trials where a new vaccine is tested against an old one. Uh, sometimes a placebo uh, could even be, uh, could contain an adjuvant or other components of the vaccine that are not the active ingredient. Uh, and Kennedy has a problem with that. He thinks that placebo can only be saline or only salt water. And uh, Paul Effett, I think, explained that very well, that the CDC's definition of a placebo is not necessarily universal, and a placebo is just something that doesn't contain an active ingredient, I think is the most simple way to put it. I, I always I find that one baffling because if I asked one of my students or one of my, you know, someone on the street what a placebo meant, I feel like the most common answer I would get was a sugar pill. <laughs> and yet a sugar pill wouldn't even yes. uh, define, go with this. So I, this one I find so so strange. Yeah. I mean, he's a lawyer. He, he uses yeah, this yeah. word play and yeah. uh, exactly. is very strategic in how he talks and again, gets away with it because there is a little bit of complexity here. Well, I have thought, I have thought some about uh, this, uh, the idea that he is a lawyer because <laughs> frequently, frequently he will uh, cite as proof that he's, uh, telling the truth or that he's right, uh, that he has won a lawsuit. Okay. Mm -hmm. On this particular topic. Okay. And I don't think that winning a lawsuit proves that you have proven a truth. <laughs> okay. All it proves is that you've won the lawsuit. Mm -hmm. So think about that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's, that kind of goes back to the, what I mentioned earlier about his organization performing publicity stunts. They'll do things like have a lawsuit where they uh, submit a Freedom of Information Act request to a government body asking them for all of their ran specifically defined uh, randomized controlled trials concerning vaccines. And the answer, they know the answer already. And the answer would be no, because these uh, studies are in the literature and not done by government bodies. So they're going to say, no, we don't have that. And then they parade that around as a win. 
uh, and their audience sees it and donates more money to them. <laughs> so it's it's very sad. What struck me about this part was that he and uh, I can right the organization he headed by what uh, Big Tree is it? no what's his name Del Del Big Tree yes Del, Del Big, Big Tree. Tree all these people seem to live in Austin too which is, I find disturbing. <laughs> <laughs> um, they want to define adjuvants themselves. So they'll, they'll say this is what an adjuvant is, and and most people have no way of of knowing, right? So they say, oh yeah, that's. That may be true. And they say, oh, it should be water or saline. And as Paul Offit has said, no. And in fact, the adjuvants are defined by the FDA, not the CDC. The FDA regulates vaccines. And so if you want to have a vaccine trial, you work with the FDA on what the adju uh, what the placebo should be. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you have an adjuvanted vaccine, it's typically the adjuvant without the antigenic component. So mm -hmm. it's it is not written that it needs to be water or, or saline. Right. Right. And I, I think that the most important point here um, is that these placebo controlled trials, these phase three trials, they are not the best evidence that we have for safety of a vaccine. The best evidence we have for safety of vaccines come from phase four trials where instead of having tens of thousands of people in a phase three trial, you roll the vaccine out to the general population, and then you have millions or even billions of doses to look at over the years. You know the rates of adverse events in the general population. For example, you know the rates of um, tonic-clonic seizures in children or um, encephalitis in children, uh, so on and so forth. And you can examine the rates of those events in people who have gotten mm -hmm. vaccinated versus people who have not gotten vaccinated. And there's always an unvaccinated group in the world because not everybody in the world has access to these vaccines and some people choose not to vaccinate. So over the almost 80 years of phase four data from most vaccines on the childhood schedule, we see that they are very, very safe. They are studied over and over and over again. And in fact, uh, one study uh, called the KIGS study uh, compared the overall health of vaccinated versus unvaccinated children and found that the major difference was that vaccinated children suffer from vaccine preventable diseases less often. That was the only major difference. So when RFK Jr. says that none of these vaccines have been tested in placebo controlled trials, he is wrong. We have lots of examples to show him here. And when he says that he wants to have them retested and <laughs> thinks that they're not shown to be safe, we have plenty of data beyond the phase three trials to show them, to show that they are in fact very safe. Yeah, vaccine safety, vaccine safety monitoring is an ongoing process for all of these things all the time, mm -hmm. uh, both formally and informally. Actually, how does the... Uh, Vaccine Injury Network work. I'm familiar with VAERS, but Paul talks about, is it va vaccine, am I quoting that correctly? Vaccine Injury Network? Uh, vaccine Safety Data Link? Uh, maybe that's maybe that's it. I think, I think that might be what you're thinking of. Um, yeah, a, a lot of these programs are just uh, passive reporting um, programs where um, a doctor or a patient will report an event after it happens uh, following a vaccination. And epidemiologists will monitor this to look for kind of blips in the signal. Uh, when cases rise above a certain threshold of what you would normally expect in the general population, then that might trigger an investigation. Um, that's generally how all of the vaccine safety monitoring systems work, but there are several. Okay. The um, RFK Jr.'s idea of, of doing a placebo trial on some of these vaccines is that that would really lead to a lot of injury because then let's say you wanted to do a uh, uh, let's pick measles. You want to do a, a placebo controlled trial of measles vaccine, and you should do it in a place where there's active measles, and there are plenty plenty of countries in the world where you could find that. You're gonna not vaccinate a certain number of kids 
with a vaccine that we know protects them against measles. And that would certainly cause kids to have measles, a fraction of whom would get encephalitis and might even die. So you can't do that. And, that, and Dan mentioned this earlier, that if you're revising a vaccine, you can't do a placebo-controlled trial because you already have one that works, and you cannot withhold that. It's called the standard of care. And it's not just vaccines, but antivirals. For the, for the hep C, direct-acting antivirals, they had to compare them to the standard of care, which at the time was interferon and ribavirin. So, and Paul makes a great story about uh, the first polio vaccine trial in 1955. There was a placebo group, which Jonas Salk did not want. He thought it was unethical. because mm-hmm. he, he thought his vaccine would work, and to withhold it from the placebo group, he thought was unethical. But they had to, to do that. And a number of children died in the placebo arm only because they didn't receive the vaccine. So, to call for renewed placebo controlled trials of existing vaccines that have been used for many years is I'm not sure what the word is. It's it's not it's not very nice. Irresponsible. Ridiculous. Irresponsible is what came to my mind, yeah. Yeah. I think Dan, you, you had a word, you a phrase in in your video, medically dis, disrespectful of the medical profession. That was I like that one, mm. right? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean it just it completely ignores decades of really hard work and paints the medical community as just kind of this complacent body that just wants to get paid and not actually do good work. And uh, that's. And we all, by the way, conspire to hide things together. So all (laughs) of us, you know, conspire and having a career in science, I find that really (laughs) amazing because you can't even, agree with your collaborators sometimes. <laughs> yeah. How, how quickly, if you're at a conference and someone presents a finding that's surprising and you see dicey data, yeah. how quickly does everybody jump on them and raise their hands? Sure. Uh, there's a subtlety in uh, vaccine safety data that uh, took me a while to get my head around that I want to point out as long as we're on the uh, topic, uh, which is that um, sometimes... Uh, an adverse effect associated with a vaccine uh, doesn't show up until after the vaccine is deployed. Okay. Right. right. Um, and uh, I'm sure that there are those out there who go, oh my God, see, I told you so. These things are unsafe. But there's a reason for this. Uh, the uh, placebo controlled phase three trials that Dan described uh, can, uh, are, are huge, like 30 or 40,000 people in the case of the coronavirus vaccines. Uh, but they aren't, that isn't necessarily a large enough population of individuals to catch very rare, uh, side effects. And it's not until you deploy it and use the vaccine in, uh, millions or tens of millions of individuals that the most rare side effects, uh, might show up. For example, this, uh, thrombosis, the clotting disorder, or, uh, myocarditis in the case of the coronavirus vaccines. Um, so uh, it's, uh, it's a way of emphasizing that uh, the value of continuing the, uh, the testing uh, to understand uh, that uh, uh, these things do happen, but they're so rare that you don't see them until you vaccinate a large population. Yeah, they're, and they're real. They certainly happen. Um, but because they're so rare, as Rich points out, um, you end up needing to do some um, statistical analysis to really do some link to the vaccine. Um, if uh, I, you know, fall over with some sort of terrible complication right now, um, it would be hard to say whether it was due to something that happened to me, like a vaccine I got like a year ago, or the fact that I ate a cupcake an hour ago. Um, you could potentially say it was either. And so we'd need to do some additional work and look at both people who ate a cupcake an hour ago and people who had things happen to them, you know, a year, vaccines a year ago or whatever, to do some more work. Um, That still doesn't mean that it doesn't suck that I fell over and had something terrible happen to me. Um, And so um, this isn't easy. And there are all of these subtleties, as Rich points out. Mm -hmm. So this this brings up an important question. So there may be side effects that we don't see 
into it goes in the general population, one in a hundred thousand, for example, for the polio vaccines, you know, one in one point four million doses of the oral vaccine may cause paralysis. And so, you know, we we understand that we're not minimizing it, and the people who do have the side effects, you know, we have compassion for that. The question is, maybe someone and many people say, well, I want to make the decision about whether to take that risk because, you know, we're saying, you know, the risk of illness from the disease is much greater than this side effect. But people may say, I want to make that decision for myself. So that's where we get into this area where of mandated vaccines. And mm -hmm. I don't know how to, to, to address that. I mean, I would my decision would always be to take the vaccine for, for me and, and kids and so forth. But what if people decide they don't want to take that risk for their kids? How do you deal with that? Because mm. I think that's a growing tide in this country that people want choice. And as Paul Offit said, he's afraid that vaccine mandates are going to go. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think it is tough to navigate that. But where my mind goes is let's look at history and see what that can teach us. And one kind of natural experiment that happened um, is in the case of vaccines and MMR, uh, measles, mumps, rubella, um, was in American Samoa. And what happened there, I think this was in the late 2010s, um, vaccine rates for childhood MMR vaccine were, were dropping. Uh, due to a series of events that um, uh, we won't get into here, but the point is that the vaccine rate was dropping. And RFK actually comes into this story because he went there and campaigned, uh, talked to the prime minister about how it was a good thing that MMR rates were dropping. Mm -hmm. And what unfortunately happened was there was an outbreak of measles. Uh, it ended up killing um, over 80 children, all unvaccinated. And that's a real world example of what happens when enough people choose the road of more risk. Because we have the science to say, to tell us that it is riskier when you choose not to vaccinate, just like it's riskier when you choose not to wear a seatbelt or choose to eat raw chicken. Um, it's not, it, it's, it's a road of more risk. And I, I don't understand why people would want to choose that, choose that other than they've been influenced by misinformation that is based on fear and right. uh, mistruths. I think that's a good way to put it. And and Paul basically said the same thing. He's he's afraid that we're going to have big outbreaks of all these diseases if we, if people get the choice. And you, and that's a great example of uh, what can happen. Yeah. Yeah. I, mean, I think also, we also have to remember about this choice. It's a choice to then you know also have your kid go to school or something like that. It we're not making you save. We're not saying you must vaccinate your kid or else. We're saying you can't vaccinate, you must vaccinate your kid or else they can't go to school. And so it's sort of like if you want to participate in the group activities, you should do things that are good for the group. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So yeah. I'm often reminded of the statistic that uh, Daniel Griffin brings up every time this issue arises in a casual conversation between, let's say, Vincent and myself and other people too. And he says, just look at all the people who are dying now from COVID-19. This is virtually none of them were vaccinated. Yeah, that's this is a, that's the a, biggest right point on, I can make because it, if you don't realize that if you don't get vaccinated, your risk of dying from this if you catch it is much, much, much higher than somebody mm -hmm. who's been vaccinated. Yeah, you took the words out of my mouth, Vincent. I think, uh, uh, Dixon, Vincent? I think the <laughs> I think the statistic is that uh, throughout the course of the pandemic and currently as well. Uh, well over 90% of the people who die from uh, COVID are unvaccinated. Mm -hmm. that, that's a really simple number. Mm 
that you can keep in your head and think about. We're emphasizing, we're going on and on about nasty side effects and that kind of stuff, but it is a risk benefit calculation and the Mm -hmm. risk is extremely low and the benefit is extremely high. All right. So uh, that, that, that statistic over 90% of the people who died from COVID were unvaccinated is just astonishing. Yes. So, or, yes. Uh, one more point to make, and also about the role of public health in the, a national program to keep all of the citizens as healthy as possible. The rules are made to protect the vast majority of people, not the exceptions to these rules. And the, there's a lot of exceptions, of course. And you can form entire groups based on exceptions. And some of them are legitimate and some of them are just driven by a mistrust of science or a mistrust of uh, politics, which makes the rules that sets the flavor of, let's say, what, what the CDC says or who's in charge of the CDC, for that matter, or the, Na- the National Institutes of Health. You can make fun of the science and, and, and all you want, but... Uh, <laughs> In the, in the short term and in the long term, all that matters to federal government, at least in this country, is the overall well-being of its citizens, every single person. And in, in order to ensure that, a lot of this has to be mandated. Children have to be vaccinated because they can spread it to other children who, aren't, who elect not to be vaccinated. Uh, that's raising the other question of defining herd immunity, which we got mixed up with a long time ago. But I think that public health is mistrusted now because it's looked at as a political thing rather than a health thing. And it's it's so misguided that uh, I'm, I'm really upset by that because I spent my whole life at a school of public health, thinking about the public's health, trying to do the best for the public's health. And uh, when you start to denigrate something as um, basic as that, based on science, based on results, based on history, uh, then I wonder what the intentions are of that person or group. All right, next, the next claim by RFK Jr. Quote, most of the chronic diseases in America started in 1989, and that's when there was a vaccine <sighs> gold rush, when every pharma company was racing to put their vaccine on the schedule. After the 1986 Vaccine Injury Compensation Program made pharma free from liability when it comes to vaccines. Wow, man, that's really got a lot of stuff. <laughs> so many wrong things. So many wrong things. So many ways. That's right. So little time to point them out. Definitely more of an ogre Go ahead, than Dan. Here. Go ahead, Dan. Start. <laughs> okay. So this is a big big claim that RFK Jr. makes that a lot of people um, like him for. Um, It's, again, one that he's been making for a long time. There's nothing new here in what he's saying. But this is what where he says that he's not anti-vaccine, he's pro-health. He cares about the health of America, and America's health is just so poor. Uh, And he blames it on uh, vaccines. at least in large part. Um, So let's examine the claims here. Uh, First, um, this idea that chronic chronic illnesses were starting in America in correlation with more vaccines on the schedule. Well, there's a lot of complexity there when it comes to public health (laughs) in America. Uh, But if you want to narrow it down to just vaccines and ask, what role did vaccines have in any increases in chronic illnesses? Let's look at the rest of the world. The rest right. of the world, uh, particularly Euro- many European countries, um, we would we would expect to see the same thing, right? Uh, if we have more vaccines, we should have more chronic illness everywhere. But in a lot of European countries, their childhood vaccination rates are actually better than ours uh, in the very high 90s, 97% plus. Uh, and their chronic disease index indexes or public health measures, they're better <laughs> than us generally. Um, maybe it has something to do with better health care. I don't know. But <laughs> um, <laughs> there's certainly no reason to think that it's vaccines, right? Uh, why, why would a country that's more vaccinated than the U.S. be 
overall healthier when it comes to chronic diseases if vaccines are causing those chronic diseases. It, it just doesn't make any sense. Um, so then the next point is that there was this vaccine gold rush. Uh, that's not really accurate. Uh, for example, in 1960, in America, there were six vaccines recommended on the CDC schedule against eight diseases. Uh, in 2020, we had 10 vaccines against 14 diseases. So not, not really a gold rush uh, in my eyes. I don't see how you can justify it that way. And also, uh, there's been a report from 2001 that showed that in terms of profit, vaccines account for 1.5% of pharma's global profits. I, I don't know how you see this as a gold rush that required all of this nef nefarious conspiring to, to pull off. Uh, it, it just doesn't make any sense. So the, he doesn't specify, but I mean, what, what chronic diseases? And I suspect if you asked him, he would not come up with much, right? Uh, well, he specifically names autism. Okay. Of course. <laughs> That's uh, probably because... the only one, right? But because all the others have been around. And in fact, autism has probably been around forever also. It's just That's that right. we have been better at mm -hmm. diagnosing it. Peter, I was listening to Peter Hotez on the, on the Rogan podcast and you know he said we called it different things we mm -hmm. used to call it mental retardation and he said we don't use that word anymore now it's under the spectrum and mm -hmm. so that's part of the reason and but it's probably been around forever and if you want to include chronic viral diseases they certainly have been around forever they didn't start in 1989 <laughs> hiv aids probably started in the early 1900s so uh, that statement alone, most of the chronic diseases in America started in 19... No. That, is, that part of it just like confuses me so greatly that I can't... <laughs> it's almost like I can't even hear the rest because I'm so confused by the chronic diseases starting in 1999. <laughs> 89. 89. 89. Yeah. <laughs> I, I was trying to imagine the, this halcyon era before 1989 without these chronic diseases. Well, this is more or less when the vaccine injury compensation... Act right, happened, right? right? Mm -hmm. And that's what he says made this gold rush because all of a sudden they're free of liability. Right. And that's the other big lie here. I mean, it, it's a total lie. Um, this, he specifically says in the Rogan podcast and many, many times in all of his interviews that uh, pharma companies have zero liability when it comes to vaccines. And he specifies when he says zero liability, he means they can be as fraudulent and as negligent as they want. That is totally not true. Um, so, I mean, my day job is I work at Janssen or Janssen, uh, as a lot of people call it, uh, <laughs> the pharmaceutical arm of J&J. &J. We, we do an enormous amount, amount of work to make sure that our drugs are going through all of the regulations that the FDA sets out for us. And that includes vaccines. Unfortunately, we don't have any vaccines on the market right now at Janssen, but they're in the same boat. They require equal, if not more, work uh, to approve, to show safety and efficacy. And if we were negligent at any point, an audit would catch it, the FDA would catch it, we'd be in big trouble. Um, and RFK knows this. Uh, he knows this because he himself is suing Merck uh, in multiple frivolous lawsuits, specifically against uh, f for the HPV vaccines. <laughs> so I don't understand how he can, on one hand, say that they are free from liability and you cannot sue them. Mm -hmm. And then he turns around and sues them for what he says they can't be sued for. What is, what's his beef with the HPV vaccine? Oh, you name it. Um, <laughs> Maybe that it prevents cancer in almost 100%. Is that his beef? Well, <laughs> he certainly doesn't acknowledge that that is the case. Um, mm. so he, you know, he thinks that it's deadly. He thinks it causes all sorts of issues. And the fact that it prevents a, an STI is also a thing that he um, talks about. Hey, you know, the right, idea of why do we need to vaccinate uh, young girls against an STI. 
Um, yeah, you're just uh, promoting promiscuity, right? That's his. That's his uh, yeah. stance. Yep. The other thing to say about this statement is that maybe there was a a bit of a rush at certain points along the way, and each one of those rushes is predicated on a new scientific discovery of ways of which you can grow viruses more effectively, or you can extract antigens more effectively, or you can make an mRNA vaccine more effectively. And every time that happens, a lot of other people get the idea of making a vaccine because now it becomes easier and more uh, systematic and more uh, easy to test and more easy to produce as well. So um, you might be uh, mixing up um, opportunists and opportunity. And I think opportunity reels out over opportunists. Um, one of the things that uh, uh, a number that RFK uses frequently is uh, during the Rogan uh, a podcast, and I, I presume in other contexts as well, is 72 immunizations. <laughs> over and over again, he's hammering on this number. Uh, and so I appreciate your list here, Dan. Mm -hmm. uh, because uh, we're currently vaccinating against 14 diseases. Yes, some of these vaccines require boosting, mm -hmm. okay? So that may require multiple immunizations. I don't know if it adds up to 72. I would be interested to know if he's counting some of the vaccine cocktails as uh, multiple mm. jabs in a jab, because mm. it's hard to, well, maybe you can add, add it up to 72. Um, yeah. But it's... Um, maybe if you get a yearly flu shot. I suppose. Yeah. yeah. So I, from what I remember about looking into that number, it's in your first 18 years of life, if you take every vaccine recommended on the schedule, including flu shots, then that it comes out to that number. Okay. Uh, but again, it's spread over 18 years. So uh, with respect to chronic disease, my understanding from uh, looking into it is that with respect to autism in particular, although RFK discounts this, uh, the authorities say that it is true that the definition of autism uh, has uh, is has changed over time, and it now captures a much larger spectrum of yeah. what is more properly called neurodiversity. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And a lot of uh, people who previously would never been have di never been diagnosed or perhaps uh, uh, given some some other uh, diagnosis. Okay, so um, uh, it's not as if the disease is actually increasing all that much, but the uh, uh, diagnosis mm -hmm. is increasing. The other thing that, I'm, that that comes to mind now, I have right here no idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> okay, but I wonder about type two diabetes. Okay, because the uh, eating habits in this country are not great. All right, and I wonder if type two diabetes. They talk about an obesity and uh, uh, epidemic as well, and I would think that there would be a type two diabetes epidemic that would go along with that. So I'd be interested in some expert comment on that. Yeah. But in terms of chronic diseases, I wouldn't be at all surprised if uh, that. Uh, uh, wasn't on the increase. And of course, that has nothing to do with vaccines. That has to do with public health. Mm -hmm. So, so Rich, I... 1989? <laughs> <laughs> of, of all the years for that to suddenly change, 1989? Yeah. <laughs> so, Rich, a couple of years ago, you and I did a podcast out at Irvine uh, about vaccines. We had a couple of vaccine experts. I, I went and listened to that today because there's a part where uh, one of the participants... Had, had published a study where there was, you know, in the 80s, many nations began to get uh, measles vaccines who had not had them before. And he looked at it and, you know, with the use of MMR, there was no increase in uh, diagnoses of autism associated with that. So it's, it's a perfect experiment where you don't have MMR vaccine, you have a basal rate of autism, and then you give it and there's no change. And so we, I'll put a link to that episode because it's actually quite a good episode talking about vaccine exemptions and so forth. But that has always stuck in my mind since that point. But if you're interested in pointing out uh, the side effects of vaccines that were unexpected, I think uh, hepatitis B vaccine is a great one to pick because it had an unexpected result and prevented liver cancer. So no one ex ever expected well, that to happen. I'm not sure that was but, unexpected. We knew that had B. Yeah, but that, that's not why they gave the vaccine to begin with. It was to prevent hepatitis. 
and in, as okay. in, and and as a result, they prevented cancer in the liver. So you know, when you talk about vaccines. Uh, you have to talk about uh, both sides of your mouth, not just one. In fact, Dan, he disparages the Hep B vaccine, right? He says, I don't know why we have to give this vaccine, <laughs> right? Uh, he disparages it in particular because it's given, uh, the first dose is given at birth. But oh, there's right. a really good reason for that. First of all, <laughs> that vaccine is nothing more than a protein. Right. It is harmless, right. okay? It's probably one of the safest vaccines out there. Uh, the reason... There's a really good reason that it's given at birth, and that is that one of the real dangers of hepatitis B is that it can be acquired perinatally, that is, uh, in the process mm -hmm. of birth from a mother who is infected. And under that circumstance, the tendency for that virus to go uh, to establish an asymptomatic chronic infection, so you are carrying it around for uh, a long time goes, uh, it's sky high. It's like in right. excess of 25% of the infections. Right. I think it may be even as high as 40%. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure the exact number, but it's huge, okay? Uh, and that is uh, that is a serious situation because not only does the individual who's infected uh, is at risk of liver cancer, but they're a carrier and they can uh, potentially mm -hmm. infect lots of, uh, lots of other individuals. So you might say, okay, so let's identify all the mothers who are uh, HBV positive and just vaccinate their children. Well, it turns out that it is uh, easier and no less risky uh, to get complete coverage. They tried that, okay? And they couldn't cover everybody because the testing became uh, so uh, awkward and uh, cumbersome. It was just easier to vaccinate everybody. And there's no downside, mm -hmm. okay? So there are really good reasons for all of this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, I would just add to that, that even after the child is born, they can still acquire hep B uh, through other means uh, other than perinatally and uh, through uh, other than sexual contact, uh, right. bites, um, so, uh, unsanitary habits uh, right. can increase the risk of hep B. It's, uh, it's the reason why science forums like this one take RFK Jr. to task because he's not trained as a scientist but he mm -hmm. claims he understands science, and apparently he doesn't. Right. That's a blatant statement, but apparently he doesn't. Well, on the, on the Friedman podcast, he made a point of saying, I have all the papers, I've read them all, and I understand them all. <laughs> Which That's... is really remarkable. Apparently he's read more than I we have. We don't even <laughs> have all the papers. <laughs> um, but, you know, the, the he, his disparaging of Hep B, you're either doing it purposefully to achieve some other goal right which i i mean i couldn't lie to uh to do that or you just don't know and i, I have i suspect it's the latter right mm -hmm. yeah yeah and, and another point that i thought was interesting in the rogan podcast was rogan himself seemed incredulous at this idea of vaccinating uh a, a baby for hep b um yeah. on their first day of life and one of the questions he asked is, aren't there treatments for it? And yes, there, there are treatments. But he, he seems to think that if there's a treatment for it, then why vaccinate? Uh, he has that same kind of attitude with COVID. We have monoclonal antibodies. Uh, he, he thinks ivermectin works for COVID. Uh, why vaccinate? And <laughs> I, I, I don't know about you guys, but that sounds pretty pro-Big Pharma to me. Because <laughs> he doesn't really have a good science background either, then, does he? Well, no, no, not at all. So then why is he pontificating then? Well. If there are hospitals, why wear seatbelts? Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, it's good. It's good. It, it, it doesn't make uh, That's a good sense. title for some episode, Brian. Store it away. <laughs> <laughs> I, like uh, I want to I want to uh, reemphasize uh, the last part of this again, where he says that the <clears throat> vaccine injury compensation program made pharma free from liability when it comes to uh, vaccines, and reemphasize why that program exists mm -hmm. is because we do live, as RFK well knows, in a litigious society, <laughs> uh, and there can be lots of uh, frivolous lawsuits. Uh, against uh, vaccine companies or, you know, anybody, but we're talking about uh, uh, pharmaceutical companies that uh, make vaccines uh, that uh, make it so that 
they cannot afford. It's not just not make a profit. They'll go broke trying to make a vaccine. And there was a crisis. I forget, uh, you know, Paul Offit's really good at uh, detailing this. But there was a crisis in the industry as a result of this uh, sort of rampant uh, litigation uh, Mm -hmm. where there used to be dozens of uh, vaccine producers and it was reduced to just four because nobody wanted to take the risk. And that's why the compensation program was instituted, okay, is so that uh, the pharmaceutical companies wouldn't be exposed to a continuous stream of frivolous lawsuits. And and the way that program is funded, if I understand it correctly, is the pharmaceutical companies pay into it. Mm-hmm. OK, they pay a they pay a fee that funds the program and it makes sure that the litigation against uh, pharmaceutical companies, which still can happen, uh, mm-hmm. is done in a much uh, fairer and uh, better controlled fashion. So if you do suffer a vaccine injury, you can uh, sue and be comp- and be compensated. Mm-hmm. Uh, that That's still true. But uh, this program needs to be in place uh, to provide some protection for the pharmaceutical in- industries. Uh, uh, otherwise, there's just uh, uh, no, uh, you just can't do it. Uh, you can't make vaccines and uh, and survive. Right. Right. Uh, and it, it reiterates the point that, you know, such a low percentage of pharma's global profits comes from vaccines. And so the, the case that you're talking about, Rich, um, there was a lot of fear uh, among parents that pertussis vaccines were causing encephalitis. Okay. Um, and th- this fear was kind of in the public consciousness. And so a lot of people were suing pharma companies because they thought their mm-hmm. children were suffering encephalitis from pertussis vaccines. And pharma makes a lot more money making treatments. Joe Rogan, they make a lot more money selling treatments. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so if a lot of parents are thinking this about their vaccines and they're suing them, they say, whatever, we're barely making any money off these vaccines anyway. Let's just sell the treatments so that when kids get encephalitis from pertussis or from measles, then we make tens of thousands of dollars per per treatment uh, treating that. Um, and then the government stepped in and said, no, we, we need you to make vaccines because we don't want our people, or our children dying. Uh, so they that was part of the impetus that set up the vaccine injury compensation program. All right. Number three, trust the science is not a function of science. It is the opposite of science and a function of religion. <laughs> Yeah, so I I included this because (laughs) part of the splash that this Rogan episode made uh, was in part due to, uh, towards the end of the podcast, when Kennedy and Rogan issued a challenge to Dr. Peter Hotez to come on and debate. And that caused a kerfuffle on social media. And it's, I think the sentiment that quote unquote, trust the science is not science and it's a function of religion kind of goes in hand in hand with that because it's all this sentiment of these scientists are just, it's more of a religion than an actual practice. And if I debate them, then I'll be able to show that they're wrong. Uh, And it's, it's just all very silly. And I think it paints this caricature picture of how science actually works um science is not uh does not function similar to a religion uh, we don't just trust uh, the phrase trust the science i it's not for the scientists it's for the general mm-hmm. public who don't understand science in science we our, our career is spent asking and answering questions And we do this by doing experiments with our lab groups, collaborators, uh, that we analyze and discuss the meaning of those results in our groups. Then we discuss those results with colleagues, present at conferences, and then we publish our work in peer-reviewed papers that continue to go through peer review after they're published. And these ideas are shared among a global scientific community scientists from all over the world, 
in independent labs and institutions, all working to answer questions. And so we don't just trust. <laughs> like we said earlier, if someone starts mm -hmm. presenting dicey data at a conference, making a claim that is very uh, surprising for the field, there are going to be a lot of questions. A lot of people are going to want to jump on it and make sure that it's a real result. Um, I can't think of a single paper I've ever read where I said, I'm going to just read the abstract and just trust. <laughs> uh, we don't do that. And you all are practicing academics. So yeah, uh, maybe you can expand on that. We, we have a saying here that says science is not a belief system. Religion is a belief system. Science is a collection of facts. Facts are based on experiments and results. And when you said dicey, I hope you can describe <laughs> what you really mean by that, is that it was a poorly um, executed experiment rather than a ironclad yes or no answer that you got. Well, maybe surprising <clears throat> result, right? No, no, or a surprising result yeah. that disagreed with all the rest of the data. Uh, and that's the point of not trust the science do you think that the science was carried out in a, uh, an objective way without a, a point of view to begin with? And a lot of times it's not. Uh, we all know this. Science is filled with, uh, replete with people's names uh, behind a, a method or an enzyme or a, 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 a functional uh, unit of some sort that they discovered, like the Hubble constant and all these. And, and every time they see it, they say, I don't think that's what it really is. I think I'll just do that again and see if I get the same result. Sometimes they do. Sometimes they don't. It depends on how you measure. So a lot of tweaking of data or, or of results, not data, but <laughs> tweaking of data. Refining. You get your paper re rejected from science. Um, refinement and questioning and re-questioning and redoing it in a different way to get the same result. That's how science advances. I think that the... One of the things people don't like is that science can change, right? Exactly. And exactly. That shows it's not a belief system, right? Yeah. We we go with the data, um, and, right. and many people have an issue with that. They think we're uh, we, we change our minds, but that's how science is, and that's contrary to this idea of trusting it because you just go wherever the data take you. The Tony yeah. Fauci took a lot of flack for that. If I heard the phrase "trust the science." <laughs> I would assume somebody meant the science as a process, like yeah. trust that refining process that Dixon yeah. was talking about, yeah. not any one individual piece of yeah, data right, 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 that right. is the piece of data from the mount. Yep. No, it's <laughs> the, the thing that I the That's thing right. that I trust of any of it is the fact that we have this continual process of asking questions and peer review and sure. refinement of the data sure. so that we will eventually get to the best possible yeah. answer we can have right now. Another way of saying that would just be to say, trust the scientific method. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's right. That's right. And, and, and uh, one of the things we're saying here is that the science is self-correcting. Mm -hmm. Correct. uh, it doesn't necessarily get it right. Doesn't nail it uh, right. all the time uh, right. immediately. But over time, things get yeah. tested again and again. Not yeah. only that, but people try and build on the framework of, uh, of a given um, – understanding of uh, what the science is saying. And if it turns out that that understanding is fraud, flawed, you can't build on it. So you have to go back and redo <laughs> the framework. And over time, uh, everything gets uh, yeah. verified. You, well, Dixon, I'm surprised you haven't come up with your phrase, trust <laughs> science, not the scientists. <laughs> well, okay? uh, yeah, I, I, I could individual, modify that. <laughs> individual, individual pieces can be an error, not yeah, deliberately, but you know, people uh, make mistakes. Yeah. This is hard. It's not so easy to do. This is the okay? anniversary of the Hubble, of the uh, James Webb Space Telescope, by the way. So they oh, asked yeah. the uh, director of the science program there uh, what the biggest surprise was that they found over the, the year that it's been in operation. And he said the biggest surprise was that we discovered as far back as we could look, there were still recognizable galaxies. And that completely trashed about 100% of the theories about how galaxies formed after the Big Bang. That, they just throw that out. That's no good anymore, folks. That doesn't work because we have a better instrument. We can look further back. 
We can see what it was like. And son of a gun, it was the same as it was now. That's remarkable because that's one, one fraction of the, the age of the universe, and yet the galaxies show up. And uh, so that came as a huge surprise. So even the most rigorous um, measurements that you can make with an instrument can be superseded by the next generation of instruments that go way beyond whatever you could do. And, when, you know, now we can do proteomics in our sleep. High school students are doing DNA synthesis and, and sequencing. Uh, a lot of advances have occurred that change the way the results are obtained. Mm-hmm. And, they're, and they're, they're more and more and more reliable. That is to say, fewer hypotheses fall by the wayside because uh, the data are so ironclad that it's hard to dispute them. One aspect that you mentioned, Dan, this idea of debating, and Paul Offit, you know, he had a beyond the noise. How, you know, how can you, should we debate the undebatable? In other words, you have an experimental fact, which is yeah. the vaccine has been shown to prevent disease and be safe. That's not debatable. Uh-huh. The data, you're <laughs> not going right. to say. Alternate facts. Well, what are you going to say? <laughs> alternate facts. We have alternate facts. <laughs> so there's no point in debating. And, all, mm-hmm. and Paul said, well, basically, if you debated RFK, he would just keep saying you're lying because that's the only defense right. he would have at one point. That's and right. it reminds me of, of uh, Jeffrey Sachs, you know, who was presented with um, the data that the, the market in Wuhan was the epicenter. He said, oh, that's just a bunch of lies. Mm. Right? Yeah. So, so he would do the same thing. So that's why no one's going to debate you. Uh, because you'll just say that's that's a lie, and you end up shouting at each other. But the facts, the data, the raw data, are not debatable. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I put some thought into this because, in a way, it's it is uh, an attractive idea to be to be able to be face to face with somebody and call out the lies. On the other hand, that's making the assumption that this person that you're facing is going to respect some sort of rule of truth or something like that. And that's just not the case. And I think the effect ultimately, since the facts are not debatable, uh, I think, well, we can argue, sure, we can argue about the facts and we will indefinitely, but uh, using the scientific method. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, but, but since the, the established facts of the vaccines are not really uh, debatable, all a debate does is give, a false legitimacy yes, uh, exactly. to the idea that there is another side to this. There isn't. Mm-hmm. I mean, I sure. think it would be a discussion. If you wanted, we could bring RFK Jr. onto this and bring Dan back and have a discussion if you wanted to. But that would legitim- legitimize uh, his positions as well, right? Yeah. I, I mean, I, I think that my thoughts on this is that generally most of the time it's a bad idea to do it mm. because a scientist versus a lawyer they're going to be having two completely different conversations <laughs> scientists are languages forget the conversation yeah, yeah I mean, scientists are uh sometimes have a hard time communicating their own work to their colleagues effectively i mean how many talks have we been in at a conference where someone is talking about something that in a way that they just lose the audience. We don't know what they're talking about anymore. Right. Uh, pretty pretty common, I think. Uh, so to expect a scientist to be able to respond to talking points that are practiced over years and years by a lawyer in this top in, in this field, yeah, um, it, it's not going to really be productive. Yeah. Uh, however, I could see um, a situation where a scientist was very well versed in his talking points and was good at debating and was able to hold his feet to the fire on questions, not let him jump around from topic to topic, not let him make uh, like go off on different claims when you're trying to address one thing. Um, I think that that could be useful, but I think that just in general, it's it's a bad idea. And an example of this that I think of as to why it's bad, um, I made a video about this on my channel where Neil deGrasse Tyson went on Del Bigtree's show. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know why he agreed to do that. 
<laughs> um, but you know, Neil, he understands general things about biology and vaccines, but when Del Bigtree brought up all of his talking points, uh, it, Neil just, I think, didn't know what he was talking about and couldn't adequately respond. And so it just looked like Dell was walking all over him. And that that's not great. So I, I don't think that people who are unprepared to debate should debate. I have two points to make about that. We brought up Neil deGrasse Tyson, I think it was just last week. And I, I found the quote that I was trying to quote. He actually said it on Twitter. You can't use reason to convince anyone out of an argument that they didn't use reason to get into. Yeah. <laughs> so that therein lies the problem. And then I was at UCSD when uh, Russ Doolittle got involved in debates about evolution versus biblical creationism. Mm -hmm. And I saw how badly that went down. I put in a link to a Washington Post article from October 1981 about that. And it just convinced me that a scientist can't success, succeed in the kind of debate that is being proposed here, where you're going to debate somebody who's not going to use facts and isn't going to use reason. It's just a waste of time. Yeah. The uh, Chinese have a wonderful expression which uh, summarizes all of this. And that is, you cannot argue with a tiger. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yep. But uh, I think the last thing I would add there is in the question of should a scientist debate someone like RFK Jr., I don't think that the, like, if someone, if someone out there is thinking of doing this or debating someone like RFK Jr., I think it's important to remember that the point of the debate is not to convince the other person because someone like Kennedy is not going to admit they're wrong. They just mm -hmm. will not. That's true. The point should be to show the audience that Kennedy or whoever it is has no idea what they're talking about. <laughs> and that's kind of what I mean with holding their feet to the fire that's right. and that's right. That's right. forcing them to explain like, okay, you think aluminum or mercury opened the blood brain barrier. How? explain molecular on a molecular scale how it does that yep. Yep. Um, get them to go into specifics and when they don't know you can show the audience like yeah you don't actually know what they're what you're talking well actually about. rogan got him he rogan actually asked a good question and you right. pointed this out mm -hmm. and rfk jr said, i i don't know that's out of my <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yep the one time rogan asked how does it do that he said oh now you're out of my expertise <laughs> Right. <laughs> okay. So we have a bunch of talking points that we can play with a little more rapidly. Yes, Dixon. Yeah, I'd be excused for, <laughs> yeah, for a moment. You have to take your headphones I off. Will. I'll be right back, folks. Don't trip. <laughs> there are wires here. Yeah. You, you, and the door's unlocked, so you'll be able to I, get I'll, back. Yeah. You'll be okay. You can edit this out. Yes. That's yeah, we'll edit it out. Uh, if, all right. A few. These are, many of these are. Easily addressed. Number one, it is questionable. These are things that RFK Jr. said. It is questionable whether HIV has ever been isolated and shown to cause AIDS. He claims that poppers and lifestyle cause AIDS. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So he didn't get this explicit in the Rogan interview, but I mean, I I suffered through reading his book that he wrote about Fauci, and he dedicates several pages, a significant page number of the whole book to this what is basically AIDS denialism and I think we can highlight here and let everybody know that Kennedy for all intents and purposes is an AIDS denier he pushes this idea that uh, HIV does not cause AIDS he pushes the idea that antiretrovirals against HIV are poison and yeah, he, he claims that HIV has never been isolated in his book. He even goes there, uh, which is absolutely wild. Um, and I, I have videos dedicated to this, but uh, <laughs> there is no question that HIV has been isolated. We know what it looks like. We know what its proteins look like. We know what its genomes look like. We know it infects CD4 uh, T cells. 
we know that it depletes them. We know that it causes a very specific form of AIDS. We know that it's not just poppers and lifestyle causing AIDS in the gay community in America. Uh, no. Um, in fact, and we've, done, we've done an inadvertent in, inoculation of people with contaminated blood right. and needles and show right. that they get AIDS. Yeah. I mean. mm-hmm. And the antiretrovirals were designed specifically based on the knowledge of the virus that uh, uh, causes the infection, and they work by uh, keeping the virus suppressed. And there are people, uh, uh, the life expectancy from age used to be uh, just a few years, and now people live uh, essentially a normal life uh, with the uh, retrovirals, so antiretrovirals. So, boy. Yeah, I I could go on for a really long time. (laughs) Um, Because I spent some time in one of my classes talking through some of these data. Um, So all of the things people said, um, people have done in inadvertent infections and actually seen HIV causing AIDS and the Koch's postulates experiments have been done in animal models. And Mm -hmm. I'm going to stop now because I would yell otherwise. (laughs) We uh, We get emails about this almost every day from people who say the same thing. Prove to me that Actually, I get emails saying, prove to me that any virus has ever been isolated. <laughs> and I say, I guess I wasted my whole career <laughs> on things that don't exist. Yeah. It's incredible. It's incredible. All right. Yeah. Number two, this is this equally. One, this one is the one. So Brianna's talked about things that, you know, she can't believe. This one is where my head blew up. So just there, saying. Jay, RFK Jr. said, there is good scientific evidence that Spanish flu was vaccine-induced. And then he goes on to say that the bacterial pneumonia that killed a lot of those people was caused by wearing masks. <laughs> this, you know, I before he went on Rogan, I had listened to a lot of RFK interviews. I had read his book. Um, I didn't think much was going to surprise me, but this surprised me. I didn't think it could get this bad. I mean, there is nothing here. Sometimes conspiracy theories and uh, these these disinformation ideas have some grain of truth. This has nothing. I don't know what he could be even trying to refer to. There were no flu vaccines back then. People didn't even know what a virus was back then. Um, there were some experiments trying to use a uh, polyclonal sera and mm-hmm. people were calling that a vaccine. Um, but really there was nothing close to what a flu vaccine would be. Uh, even nothing even rolled out on a global scale that would cause something like the 1918 flu. I wondered where, the, uh, where this came from. And I do recall from reading, what is it? The great influenza, not that that's necessarily an authoritative resource. Uh, but I did some, uh, reading recently to, uh, try and back this up. Uh, at the time of the Spanish flu, uh, as you say, people had isolated, they didn't know it was a virus. People had an isolated influenza virus, but there was a school of thought that it was a bacterial infection in particular, mm-hmm. since people died of yeah, bacterial pneumonia. Right. And so there were attempts to make, uh, attempts made to create a, uh, a bacterial vaccine. Mm-hmm. And I believe that was uh, tested on, uh, some individuals, but that was of no consequence and certainly didn't, uh, cause the disease. I can see where that might, uh, uh, seed this sort of spin okay but <laughs> it's uh it's a i mean uh, influenza virus was not isolated until 1933 right so mm-hmm. you couldn't have even made an influenza virus vaccine back then so yeah. that's crazy that's just crazy yeah and uh, we've seen pictures of the masks that were used in 1918 and they were basically like gauze they they were they yeah. wouldn't stop a flea i mean you know. it's dangerous if we uh use a date for saying you couldn't possibly have a vaccine because we didn't know what a virus was because pasteur did obviously make a vaccine against rabies and he didn't know what that was either right right but there were no flu vaccines in 1918 no 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 i yeah. I, I, I totally sure. agree with that i mean i i think that yeah i mean i'm probably giving him more credit he I'm assuming he's saying it was the flu vaccine that caused the 1918, but maybe he's not even thinking so clearly. I don't know. Yeah, that's a big problem. But either way, there is very good 
phylogenetic genomic evidence that right. Right. it was a virus that had been previously circulating. So mm -hmm. um, Michael yeah. Warby has has published on that. We, we've covered it on TWIV. Uh, this is a virus that was uh, around before, so no need to, to... I think it's a general anti-vaccine rant. You know, it's part yeah. of his... His mm -hmm. the vaccines sure. are dangerous, and sure. we need to make it so that everybody can choose whether to take them or not. Right. And I just want to <laughs> point out another part that just showed Rogan's incredulity in this podcast. Well, both of them, I guess, <laughs> because when they were talking about the 1918 flu, um, they were going on on the fact that uh, it was actually bacterial pneumonia that yeah. is thought to have oh, killed most right, of the people. Right. Yeah. And they, they talk about it, and Rogan seems to think that that means that flu was killing mostly people who were already sick. Mm -hmm. Th through all of their talking, and they even read like a portion of some page on the internet that was explaining <laughs> this concept, they, they did not understand that the flu was causing those bacterial infections. That right. flu pretty much mm. destroys your airways if it's severe enough and mm. Mm. makes you all but defenseless against bacterial colonization. And then that can deliver the final blow. But you obviously have to have the flu infection before you get the, in order yeah. to actually get the bacterial infection. They, they did not get that. And that blew me away. I was, I was <laughs> astounded that I was listening to two grown men completely missing that concept. I think there's a level of science understanding and, and you know, and non-scientists, yeah. unfortunately, yeah. I don't mean yeah. to disparage it, but, um, you know, if you, either of them listened to this program or yours for a year, they probably would know a lot more. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I All joke right. in my video that the average viewer reading one of the sources that, that we link, uh, will probably get you to the place where you know more than either of them. All right, number, the next one, Wi-Fi causes cancer and opens the blood-brain barrier. So, so RFK Jr. said, yeah, it's been shown you get tumors behind the ear that you use for your cell phone. And that's where Rogan said, how does this work? And he said, ah, that's out of my specialty. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Above my yeah. pay grade. <laughs> yeah, it's. I mean, this is just a real simple one. Um, there's a mechanism by which radiation can increase your risk of cancer. Non-ionizing radiation doesn't break DNA bonds, so it's a lot harder for it to do things that can increase the risk of cancer. And scientists have studied whether or not brain cancers have increased since cell phones became more ubiquitous. It hasn't. There's just nothing there. This, uh, I actually have a, a relative uh, who... Uh, uh, who died? Uh, the, uh, a relative whose relative died of a um, glioblastoma. Okay, that they attribute this to cell phone use. Um, I think when these tragedies happen, people there's uh, there's a uh, a need mm -hmm. to find a cause or to blame somebody. Sure. Or something like that. Uh, and so uh, here's the compassion theme again. All right. Yeah. It's hard when, when some, I mean, glioblastoma is just really ugly. And to see somebody go down with that is really a difficult thing. And I guess, I, I guess I'm kind of sympathetic with wanting to, you know, get at a cause or uh, somehow blame somebody for this or something i'm i i'm trained in understanding that stuff happens okay <laughs> good things happen to bad people bad things happen to good people there is a lot of randomness out there all right glioblastoma happens there may be uh, i don't know there may be uh, i'm sure there are risk factors and that kind of stuff but it ain't cell phones um, and you know, it's hard to deal with, but I think people, people need scapegoats somehow. Right. And that's how this stuff, uh, gets propagated. Or they need to understand it at their level of education. Yeah. Yeah. 
I mean, is it possible? I mean, as Dan said, it's not the right kind of radiation, but you, just, you don't know. You you look for it, and nothing has come up. But it maybe there's a rare occurrence that you can't pick up in these studies. But he's he was giving you the impression that you know they're right behind the ear, and it happens all the time, and that's just not right. Right. All right. The next one. It is hard for an infectious disease to kill a healthy person. <laughs> yeah. This, I mean, this, I think, seems to be what motivates Rogan a lot. And a lot of people who subscribe to this vaccine hesitant or anti vaccine mindset that if you just stay healthy, if you exercise, you eat a good diet, all that, that you won't be affected by infectious disease. Mm. And it's annoying because to an extent it could be to an extent there's something to that obviously staying healthy is good uh if you're not very healthy you have a lot of extra problems you're going to be more likely to be taken down by an infectious disease but healthy people die from infectious diseases all the time uh notably children young children uh are, when they're stricken with vaccine preventable diseases, um, they can die in high numbers. And so just this, I, I think it's sad to watch someone like Rogan see the harsh, scary reality that infectious diseases are out there and can hurt anybody and substitute that reality with, I don't need to worry about that because I'm healthy. Well, that's Rogan's data point. He's he said I'm healthy and I don't. Although he did get COVID, right? So, mm -hmm. he and then he says he got he got ivermectin, and he said nobody cares that I got ivermectin and I got better. He, he got COVID. <laughs> he got COVID and then better anyway. <laughs> he got COVID and then took a medicine cabinet's worth of drugs. Yeah. I mean, ivermectin, azithromycin, prednisone, monoclonal antibodies. antibodies. Maybe that's yeah. what. <laughs> <laughs> maybe that's what helped him. Yeah. Um, maybe maybe he's never heard of malaria. Um, yeah. Yeah. And in fact, since we mentioned ivermectin, uh, I think RF. And this is one you highlighted also. RFK said, "Well, when you have something that works, um, you can't introduce anything else." And so he says, "That's what we had COVID vaccines, so that's why we weren't allowed to use ivermectin." And, and you went nuts over <laughs> that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, that was a ridiculous claim. So uh, he, did he's, Campbell, he's claiming there that um, that with an EUA, uh, you wouldn't have been able to pass an EUA for vaccines, uh, EUA being emergency use authorization, if you have an effective drug beforehand. Yeah, right, right, right. And that's, I mean, if you just look at what happened, you would know that that's not true. Early in the pandemic, Dr. Griffin was talking about all the treatments they were doing to treat COVID patients. There were right. um, re repurposed drugs that were approved for use in COVID, uh, tocilizumab, corticosteroids, uh, even I think monoclonal antibodies came on the scene before vaccines. Yes. So if we had those that people acknowledged worked or had some efficacy, why were vaccines allowed <laughs> if if what Kennedy is saying is true? Um, it, it's just bizarre. And even after we had an EUA for vaccines, we had EUAs for well, more vaccines and for... Um, uh, Paxlovid. Paxlovid, yeah. So, mostly, yeah. Mostly drugs uh, treat and vaccines prevent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So maybe that's the big difference that he doesn't see. Mm -hmm. well, also, they simply don't want to understand, and Dr. Daniel Griffin has talked about this. Many studies have shown that ivermectin doesn't work. Right, right. Does not yeah, reduce again, does again. not reduce progression to hospitalization and death, no. and that's mm -hmm. that's it. End of yeah. story. Mm -hmm. That is a fact. Yep. That's a fact. Mm -hmm. It's not debatable. That's right. It is also a fact that vaccines don't cause autism. Right. That is true. Right. But people like Kennedy will say that. Those ivermectin trials were rigged. They were given yes, the course. wrong dose, the wrong yep. timing, whatever. But no, there are several randomized controlled trials. It's been tested whether or not ivermectin prevents you from getting into the hospital with COVID. It's been tested at 
doses that are perfectly normal for treating yep, yep. for its use. Uh, it's been tested at higher doses. Uh, it mm-hmm. just doesn't work in any any which way. It's important to remember that when Trump caught COVID, he was not treated with ivermectin. He was treated with <laughs> monoclonal antibodies. Right. Eight <laughs> grams of monoclonal antibody. Exactly. That's a lot. It's crystallizing in his <laughs> I, urine. I, re- I say that because <laughs> the day after I read that news article, I went into the lab and weighed out eight grams of something just to look at it. <laughs> right. Oh, you should have taken a picture and put it on it Twitter. It looked just I, like I ivermectin. I actually have the picture. <laughs> it's kind of too late now, though. Yeah, it is. <laughs> You know. um, all right, one, let's do just one more because most of these others uh, we've really touched on mm-hmm. um, uh, unless you want to pull one out. But the, we haven't really talked about Mercury. He makes a lot of noise about Mercury and, and uh, his in the Rogan and, you know, talks about huge boluses of Mercury and childhood vaccines. Right. Mm-hmm. So let's talk a bit about that, Dan. Yeah, I mean, I mean, well, first of all, mercury is not in any childhood vaccines anymore. That <laughs> was right. removed in 2001. Uh, and that's an interesting story because when when Kennedy started out, uh, his children's health defense, it was called it was called something about the something about mercury was in the name. Uh, mm-hmm. That was his his whole thing that mercury is in vaccines and that's bad. And that's why we have autism and that's why we have this and that's why we have that. When they took that ingredient out in 2001 and nothing really changed, he didn't backtrack and say, oh, well, we were wrong about that. He just switched gears. Um, So that shows kind of his dishonesty there. But uh, I think Paul Offit talks about this really well. Um, Let's look at like what mercury is and what it does in in vaccines it's it's uh in vaccines as a component called thimerosal its purpose is to act as a preservative uh kennedy will say that um it doesn't kill bacteria uh that's not its purpose to kill bacteria it's called a bacteriostatic agent it prevents bacteria from growing so that that's a distinction whether or not you want to kill a culture of bacteria or prevent mm. them from growing in the first place, uh, and it does indeed prevent bacteria from growing. Um, and it's in the form of ethyl mercury, not methyl mercury. So, methyl mercury is a form of mercury that can uh, bioaccumulate much more easily than ethyl mercury. Uh, so it can cross the cell membrane and hang out in tissues. Uh, and that's the kind of mercury that we find in tuna fish or in the Earth's crust. It's what we're exposed to on a daily basis. Um, ethyl mercury in vaccines is different. It doesn't quite have those properties where it bioaccumulates. Uh, your body is able to excrete it a little easier. And there have been multiple studies into how mercury exposure in vaccines Hmm. compares to your daily exposure of mercury and it's minuscule. Uh, And more importantly, the epidemiological data has never shown an association of thimerosal and vaccines with uh, adverse neurological outcomes, with autism, none of that. Um, But nowadays, it's not even in childhood vaccines. It's only in um, high dose, uh, multi multivalent flu vaccines, uh, which are mostly available for, uh, adults. And you can choose to not have one, uh, that has mercury. And so nowadays his argument is that pregnant, uh, women should not be getting flu vaccines that contain mercury. Uh, his evidence for that is, uh, nothing really, but he claims that it's harmful somehow to the fetus. There's no evidence to suggest that. Uh, There have been plenty of safety studies into flu vaccines in pregnant women. Not only are they safe, but uh, during pregnancy, you uh, become sort of immunocompromised. Uh, You become high risk to infectious disease. And so it's really important to, to prevent those severe infectious 
uh, diseases because if a if you're pregnant and you experience a severe infection, not only are you more at risk, but the uh, fetus is at more risk. So again, the risk benefit comes out in favor of vaccines, and Kennedy doesn't like that. So he 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 recounted a conversation twenty years ago with Paul Offit. Mm-hmm. You know, where Paul said, well, there's good mercury and bad mercury. He was trying to ex- explain this to him. And Kennedy says, I look at the periodic table. There's just one mercury. That's, he lied to me. It's so yeah. disingenuous, right? Right. Yeah, I, <laughs> I, 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 talked, I talked to Paul about that. And I said, so Kennedy said you lied in this conversation. Paul <laughs> asked, well, what, what's the lie? And I said, well, and I... I said basically what you said and Paul just laughed. I had some correspondence with Paul just yesterday uh, that uh, is a satellite to the same discussion because it was it was in the same discussion where Kennedy's talking about talking to Paul and he does uh, Kennedy does a, something that he does several times in different circumstances uh, where he says that um, off it during this conversation said that he had uh, you know, he could uh, show him the data that proved that his statements were wrong or that Kennedy actually said, yeah, show me that stuff. And Paul uh, uh, promised to send him these articles and then off it never did, according to Kennedy. And the implication is that the evidence wasn't there. Mm-hmm. And this is like the FOIA request thing that you were talking about uh, earlier, Dan. So I I wrote to Paul and I said, is this true? And he says, if he had asked me to send the articles, I would have. He (laughs) makes it up. There were about five studies at the time that had exonerated thimerosal. He never asked me to send him those studies. Mm -hmm. Also, somewhere else, he says, uh, maybe it's Friedman. He said, you know, I asked Fauci for this evidence. and He sent me a whole bunch of papers uh, that weren't related as if he's implying that he was covering something up. But again, he makes it up, right? Right. Uh, something occurred to me while you were talking about this, Dan, uh, and that is that um, science does not just discard these various claims, like autism being caused by a vaccine no. <laughs> or thimerosal being harmful. This stuff comes up. All right. Mm -hmm. And the scientific community takes it seriously and they Mm -hmm. jump on it and they do all kinds of stuff. And in particular, with respect to the autism, I think you've said there are something like 18 different studies uh, all over the world involving millions of children, Mm -hmm. none of them showing any association at all. But importantly, the studies were done. Okay, that that, is this true? Because if it if it is true, it's important. Okay, but it's not. Okay. Right. Same. And I think that that's a key part of that um, compassion thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. People heard things like this, said, hmm, that, that would be an issue if that's true. Let's do a study and found that that wasn't the case. And I hope that they do a different study on some other random thing and find that it is the case and then stop it. But this was not it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right. All right. Any uh, Dan, any of the other points you wanted to cover? If not, we'll stop here. Uh, uh, I, had a, I had a bunch of these after you had added some, but I think yeah. we've, covered, we've covered most of them, I think. Yeah, I think we've covered uh, most of them. And yeah, I, I think that that's, that's a good length there. I mean, there, there are many other things he said, which are incorrect, but the, you know, we've, we we don't need to go over every one. There's right. very little that he says with respect to vaccines that's factually correct. Mm-hmm. And it's really, you know, people may say, well, you're being unfair, but no, it's the case. I, I waited to hear something correct, but there really isn't anything there. And it's a shame because you would think if if someone wants to spread misinformation, they should mix it up with some good stuff, right? So <laughs> so you can't tell or something, but... Well, the good that stuff either. that he mixes it up with is the, his compassion. Thing, right. Okay? I guess so. I As guess he so. he says yeah. that yeah, uh, right. people come to him who are in yeah. distress, okay, looking for answers, uh, and he feels their pain, and uh, these are his answers. 
Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. I think the only other thing I would want to say here is that, you know, I think most of your audience is fairly well versed in science. And so a lot of these ideas that we bring up might seem totally ridiculous. And some people might wonder, why are we even talking about this? Um, And I think there's a good reason for it. And it's that this man, RFK Jr., he's running for president. And he appeared on, again, the most listened to podcast in the world, where the host was treating him very favorably and believing a lot of what he said. And his ideas are genuinely harmful. They have genuine real world consequences that result in children dying or people dying uh, preventable deaths. Um, I talk in my video about a specific example of a woman who refused to take antiretrovirals for for HIV infection. And as a result, her and her infant daughter ended up passing away. And these ideas are ridiculous and we can laugh at them um, and talk about the science, but they have real world consequences. And so I would ask uh, to those in the scientific community who are listening to this, you probably already care about science communication, but science communication is so important. Um, We need to do better at combating these ideas because what good is all of our work, hard work that we put into science if a significant portion of the population listens to Joe Rogan instead and doesn't believe the findings that we put out. Um, So I'm just going to (laughs) ask, please do what you can to combat disinformation. You don't have to start a podcast. You don't have to start a YouTube channel. (laughs) Just a little bit helps. If you are in in a niche field where there's some disinformation, speak up. You could really help. Dan Wilson, debunk the funk. Thank you so much for joining us, Dan. Thanks, everybody. It was good to be here. Any, yeah, thanks, Dan. Anytime, anytime you want to come back and talk about something, you're welcome. Okay. I really appreciate that, and you guys take care. And Dan, so, I love your podcasts. They're yes. right on the money, and Thank I would you. I would recommend them to anybody. Uh, Thank you, you you do all the hard work uh, that uh, that I don't have to do. I can listen to your podcast. <laughs> I I really wouldn't wish sitting through a three-hour Rogan podcast on anybody, but I listen at two times speed. So, <laughs> so, so Dan, the people complain to us that we're too long, yet they listen to three hours of him. Why is that? I don't, I don't think that's, yeah. If 30 million people regularly listen to Joe Rogan episodes that are all three hours long, uh, you guys can be. Uh, the unemployment rate must blood. really be high. <laughs> Oh, Dan, awesome. Thank you so much. Yes. Sorry. Thanks, Brian. <laughs> Thank you, Dan. Right. Thanks again. See you, Dan. See you all. See you See all. You. Take care. Bye-bye. It's time for some picks. Dixon. <laughs> Always. Dixon, this is yes. your last jazz pick. This is the big one. What do you got for us? Well, um, I haven't mentioned two people uh, in the same breath, but I will now because uh, they were giants among giants. Um, so they're go the, the goats, the greatest of all time, uh, Louis Armstrong and Duke Ellington, um, Louis Armstrong or Louis Armstrong, uh, or pops as he used to be known as, uh, did more f- to spread, um, the medium of jazz throughout the world than virtually anybody else. And a lot of other people followed in his footsteps, but he was one of the first. He was called the ambassador of jazz. And wherever he went, people gathered around and they loved him. He was high spirited. He was extremely talented and he loved playing with other great players. And he of course made records with Duke Ellington and uh, Ella Fitzgerald and lots of other people also. And so, uh, he's my all-time favorite. Uh, I, I don't always listen to his Dixieland jazz uh, versions much because uh, they're sort of out of date. Uh, I'm more of in, into modern jazz right now, but um, his smile tells you everything. And if you watch a movie called High Society, uh, you'll get a kick out of it because he introduces the movie and he ends the movie also. Uh, so it's it's a remarkable um later uh, Louis Armstrong version of his ultimate talents. Duke Ellington 
wrote so much music and played so much music and played with so many people that it's it, it, there are no faults to be found. They, there are just um, remarkable expressions of a genius. Um, there's a personal note here, uh, no pun intended. A friend of mine and I, uh, he was in pathology department, and I, I was still in the uh, tropical medicine department at that point, uh, came to me one morning, and because I knew he played trumpet, and he knew I played trombone, and he he looked at me with a sad look in his face, and he said, guess where I was last night? And I said, gee, I, I really don't know. Where? He says, I was doing an autopsy on Duke Ellington. Ooh. And he performed the autopsy, and he died of a sarcoma, a lung sarcoma. He was a heavy smoker. And that's all he did with uh, 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 his sidekick, and I'm blocking on his name right now, but I'll, I'll think of it, of course, at 3 in the morning. Uh, they used to drive around the countryside in the afternoons before their performances, thinking of what to write next in terms of wonderful music. And uh, they were smoking up a storm, of course, and uh, that's that's what he died from. So both of those men were just fabulous. And I, I would put Ella Fitzgerald in there as well. Uh, I didn't, but I, I should have. Uh, she was a wonderful spokesperson for jazz as well. She never said no to an invitation to sing. And she used to sing with all the best. So, yeah, and Ella Fitzgerald. That's absolutely right. Maybe you should put her first. <laughs> um, those are my three picks. I, I've enjoyed this ride with you. Thank you for allowing me the excess of uh, revealing my musical tastes uh, over these last, what, I think 15 or 16 twivs, at least, maybe more. Seems like years. It seems like years, <laughs> but I could. I, obviously, it's an ongoing thing. Jazz is still being invented. What are you going to do next? I don't know. You going to do another series? Yeah, I, I'm going to think of something. Okay, so um, do that. That was, was fun. I, I learned a lot. That's Good. cool. Mm -hmm. I'm glad. Brianne, what do you have for us? Uh, I have an article that I read earlier this week where mm -hmm. I felt like I learned a lot of things I didn't know already. Um, so in this article, um, scientists are talking about finding a site that marks um, the Anthropocene. And I've heard about the Anthropocene mm -hmm. as sort of this new part of the Earth's history where there is human impact. Um, but uh, they, this article talks about the fact that there are um, specific definitions for some of these um, geological times. And they uh, were trying to actually have a specific definition for how we define the Anthropocene. Um, they've come up with the idea that it starts around 1950 because of nuclear weapons tests. And they found a uh, apparently for each different geologic area, there is a place on Earth with a golden spike that best defines the um, uh Thing, the changes you see in the earth at that time. Um, and they have found a place that they would like to at, put a golden spike for the Anthropocene, which is a lake <laughs> in Ontario where they see a lot of plutonium deposits from early nuclear tests. Um, and then later in the article, there are some arguments about is 1950 really where the Anthropocene starts and is it really about nuclear tests and things like that. And I guess it was a, this was a word that I had sort of heard thrown around as just the times where human impacted the earth or something like that. Um, and thinking about the idea of how you would discover this and having a golden stake um, to mark the geological place where the, we best see the era were all things I'd never really thought about before. Um, so I got a kick out of reading this article. Uh, this is a magazine now by that name, by the way. <laughs> what? Yes. I, I subscribe to it. Yeah. The Anthropocene. Yeah. Really? Uh -huh. Okay, thank you, Brianne. Kathy, what do you okay. have for us? I, I picked an article that's uh, from the Washington Post and just very timely. Um, the title is, uh, Don't Crank Down Your Thermostat When It's Hot Out, Do This Instead. And so the long story short is that people think if they set their thermostat down to 60, they'll get more cooling than if they have it set at 70. And that's not really true. It's just that your air conditioner will just work longer and harder and you'll increase global warming indirectly by <laughs> wasting the energy. Um, they talk about some other things that you can do. And one of them that's always been my favorite since I lived in Georgia, which is how much good ceiling fans can do. And they typically don't use a lot of energy. Right. And I always found that if I had my air conditioning set to 
82, but I had a fan on, I was completely comfortable. And so uh, they don't even recommend anything as high as 82 in this Washington Post article, but um, I found it works for me. So it just has some other ideas in there. And since things are hot all over, it's not going to solve all the problems, but it might make you feel better. I find that the biggest problem is having multiple people in one house because everyone has a different comfort, <laughs> right? I want yeah. this, and then you get this 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 ping yo yo. What do you call it? A, a seesaw right. seesaw thermostat. Someone oh, sets right. it up. Someone sets it down. I just put a a, a jacket on and wear a jacket everywhere. Yeah, I let yeah. Uh, I let <laughs> I let my wife deal with that, and I just well, I just accept whatever she says is right. And then, Vincent, don't you also have a thing about the temperature being an odd number or an even number? Oh, yeah. Oh, it's got to be an even number for sure. <laughs> and then I know when someone has put it on an odd number that they're, they're trying to fool with me. Yeah, for sure. Well, Vincent, our house is currently set at 77, I think, so you uh -oh. wouldn't be very comfortable here. You, you may ask how I, how I can fly in a 777. <laughs> <laughs> But I do. That's pretty cool. So if uh, if you put it at 60, you'll also spend a lot of money because that's incredibly cold, right? Yes. Yeah. But very, in the end, the, the set temperature is lower. It's just that you're not going to cool any right. faster, right? right. Yeah. That right. makes sense. Rich, what do you have for us? Uh, I don't think I picked this before. This is a uh, sort of relatively sort of new uh, uh, series in the Star Trek franchise star trek strange new worlds it's now in season two uh it's halfway through season two there's about 10 episodes uh per season and i think i'm a trekkie actually uh, i really <laughs> we, all, uh, we all knew that really <laughs> uh i really like this it's uh it is uh pre uh james t kirk enterprise mm -hmm. it, the captain of the enterprise is christopher pike uh right. and it's great because it riffs on all of the standard you know, Star Trek lore things. Uh, anybody who's at all a Trekkie will know that Christopher Pike dates back to the original episode. There was an episode about him being the previous commander of the Enterprise and uh, uh, a bad things happened to him. So this is in the standard, in, in the old time uh, tradition of Star Trek, where every episode uh, is a new sort of exploration adventure. It's the same five-year mission uh, to uh, just explore. It's got uh, this, uh, in addition to Pike, it's got the uh, younger Ohura. Mm. It's got uh, the younger Spock. Uh, McCoy is not there. Chekhov is not there. Sulu is not Scotty? there. But it's Scotty? got those two. Uh, and uh, it's got some other characters who have. Oh, it's got um, Christine Chapel, the nurse. Okay, mm. um, so it's cool. I enjoy it. <laughs> All right. So I, as you know, for for Catherine Wu last week, I subscribed to the Atlantic. So there are some other good articles besides hers in there, and one that I, I found is called. Step aside, Joe Biden. The president has no business running for office at age eighty. And it's interesting, you know, he says, I'm very grateful for what Biden did, but but we need to move on. But um, so there's some interesting arguments for why. But I, I found one part of it. Um, he wrote, in my modest line work of university level teaching. So the author, who is um, Elliot Cohen, is a professor uh, the ranks are filling with geriatric incumbents who refuse to get out of the way of younger people coming up. They fool themselves into thinking that they are as good as they always were, even as they deliver lectures from 30-year-old notes <laughs> <laughs> or cease to produce cutting-edge work. The academic world has its own senatorial or presidential size egos, and the result is a comparable level of narcissistic self-indulgence by staying in the spotlight. Quietly, university presidents fret about this, which is why professors my age get attractive buyout offers and various post-retirement perks. And before some of my fellow aging pedagogues begin sending me their latest articles in science or their Boston Marathon times, I will say again, yes, there are exceptions. But then, then don't all of us fool ourselves about how exceptional we are. I thought that was great. First of all, 
So I always look at things through my own lens, right? So I gave up my lab. I gave up my office. So I'm not in anybody's way, okay? And university president didn't offer me any package. <laughs> no package for me or post-retirement perks. Nope. <laughs> it's cheaper to pay me a base salary than to give me a package. But I'm happy to be able to, to teach. And My notes are not 30 years old. Um, no. I do update them every year. The guy teaching Shakespeare, though, his notes are that old. <laughs> I thought it was funny, though. Maybe older. It's, uh, mm -hmm. it's true. You know, you got to move on, folks, and, and let other people. There's limited space in every profession. Uh, let other people have a crack at it. It's, it's, anyway, it's an interesting take on, um, you know, the it's, it, what he says, 67 is the new 66. I don't, I, I don't quite <laughs> Oh, that's good. You know, I he like talks it. about how like old people think they can, you know, exercise and eat well and live forever. But he says, uh, you know, we yeah. things happen as you age. And yeah. people who step down voluntarily, like David mm -hmm. Souter, right, we should applaud them because um, they do the right thing. Or Dick de Pommier. Or Dick de Pommier. All right, we or have Richard a listen. Condon. That's right. We have a pick, a listener pick from Kim. I've been a huge fan of all the Twix podcasts since 2015 when I was finishing high school and wanted to learn more about microbiology. You've all been a huge inspiration to me and kindled a deep passion in all things virology and microbiology. Fan mailing aside, since in TWIV 1005, you discuss the Myris viruses as potentially potential mission link between two virus realms. I was thinking you guys may be interested in discussing one similar such story, namely the discovery of flavobacterium infecting, lipid-containing phage, FLIP, a potential missing link in the evolution of single-stranded DNA and double-stranded DNA viruses. It's a PNS paper. Although this paper came out before the new mega taxonomy of viruses was properly established, FLIP is now a member of the realm Varidnaviria, a.k.a. PRD1 adenovirus lineage, which previously only consisted of double-stranded DNA viruses. A recent paper also discovered a single-stranded DNA lipid-containing temperate phage with the same properties of FLIP. What was interesting about this, in my opinion, was that it showed that this phage type is probably very common and found around the world. Keep up the good work, making hard science accessible and inspiring the next generation of science enthusiasts. Well, Kim, 2015, it is five, eight years. So you finished college and a couple, and then maybe it sounds like you're getting a PhD because you know your, your virus stuff. <laughs> it's really good. Good for you. And if we had any part in that, well, we're very happy. Uh, that is TWIV 1026, show notes, microbe.tv slash TWIV. You can send your questions and comments to TWIV at microbe.tv. If you enjoy our work, we hope you do. Please consider supporting us, microbe.tv slash contribute. Dixon de Pommier can be found at trichinella.org and thelivingriver.org. Thank you, Dixon. You were very welcome, Vincent. Thank you for um, <laughs> allowing me back into the family. <laughs> Allow you're part of the team, and uh, we're happy to have you. You should come um, here every now and then. Good to be back. Kathy Spindler's at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Thanks, Kathy. Thank you. This is a lot of fun. Rich Condit, Emeritus Professor, University of Florida, Gainesville, currently in Austin, Texas. Thank you, Rich. Sure enough, always a good time. You know, you said all these anti-vax types are in, in Austin, but we have Ginny Sue, remember? <laughs> yeah. Vaccinate oh, yeah. Okay. Texas. She was a <clears throat> TWIV That's right. 500. Right. Yeah. I was so there. You were, everybody was there. Good. It was very cool. It's good. It's good. Brianne Barker's at Drew University, Bioprof Barker on Twitter. Thanks, Brianne. Thanks. I learned a lot. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I'd like to thank the American Society for Virology and the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIV, Ronald Jenkins for the music, and Jolene for the timestamps. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. 